of on, as you may guess. Um, right, welcome everybody. Our first meeting of the year, of course, and thank you for coming along. Um, do we have any apologies for absence? Both, all three groups. Any apologies? I understand Councillor Parker has sent apologies. Councillor Parker from Solihull, okay. Right. Um, declarations of interest. Anybody need to make any uh, declarations? No. No? Okay. Now, uh, the reason I waited a bit for people to, to roll up is because I think the first... Uh, the first thing I'd like to uh, take in Chair's remarks really is really our first proper opportunity to look at tributes for um, Roger Horton, uh, a former member of this group and in fact of all uh, incarnations of the West Midlands Transport uh, member involvement uh, body uh, dating right back to the 19, 1980s when uh, we had uh, deregulation and passenger transport executives and so on. Um, so I don't want someone to roll up in the middle of uh, the one minute silence, but that's what we will do first. We will take a one minute silence uh, to show our respects uh, inwardly to, uh, to Roger Horton, who died uh, late last year. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, let's look at uh, uh, take our tributes to Roger's uh, life and contribution to uh, transport regionally, locally, and if not nationally, over the years. Um, what a tremendous uh, record Roger had, both as um, a supporter and worker for public transport the needs of the uh, the passenger uh, and also you know for the community in around uh, in and around Sandwell and what a really good friend and really great fellow he was but I will turn to to Richard Worrell yeah. really who, who's known probably known Roger for longer than anybody here and uh, was more closely associated with him during his time uh, as part of our committee in its previous incarnations and since uh, Roger stood down from Sandwell Council in 2019. So Richard. Yes, thank you, thank you Kevin. Thank you. I, I, I totally um, endorse what you've said about Roger. I mean, Roger was a very long-standing piece of the West Midlands public transport furniture um, and um, also with wider interests he was a member of West Coast Rail 250 um, and uh, he did uh, put himself around um, the nation's uh, public transport um, 
um, infrastructure, particularly rail, uh, quite assiduously and, you know, uh, with all of the best intentions to, 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 to make sure that we got the best we possibly could in terms of public transport in, in the West Midlands. Um, I was looking through old stuff the other day and uh, I remember, um, I do remember a couple of things from the past. Um, I remember going to Immingham to see the um, arrival of the first um, Midland Metro tram. I think this is about 1990. I, I can't quite remember the date, but um, guess who was there as well? <laughs> Roger Horton and uh, the, the tram was taken on a low loader. Um, it had arrived from Spain and it was taken to the Wensbury depot. And uh, soon after that, trams started to enter service and um, have been uh, doing that mainly ever since. I, I just want to talk um, about about the funeral. Obviously, it was a very difficult time um, um, for attending funerals. Um, Roger died um, at some stage in December and the funeral took place on, on the 23rd of December at Sandwell Creme. Um, and all I want to say about it is that um, it, the whole event was sad, but it was also typically Roger and family, really, because it was also good humoured uh, and, and, and positive. And um, I, I thought there were some lovely uh, tributes, both um, at the funeral itself and, and, and at the wake. And um, you will be interested to know, if you didn't, that... Um, uh, Councillor John McNicholas was there, Councillor Phil Bateman and myself. So you had three former PTA chairs there to pay tribute. And I'd also like to um, record the presence at the funeral of Toby Ratcliffe um, and Malcolm Holmes. Um, and as I say, that, that was just, um, I thought, uh, uh, an amazing tribute. Um, and um, what I would also like to say finally is that um, Linda and, and Roger's family ha did have a really difficult, difficult time over the past years since Roger had his um, accident, which um, rendered him pretty much blind. But then that was followed by a stroke which from which he never recovered. And it was nice to think that um, we were able to... Um, make that that final tribute and i think the last time i saw him i saw him quite often since he became ill but um i think the last time i saw him in public was when we named roger horton way uh which is the um the footpath up from the hawthorns metro stop for people who would be going to the hawthorns so that's it um colleagues thank you very much for listening okay thank you uh, roger yeah, so if people go along to the Hawthorns station and walk along the path up towards the West Bromwich ground, um, and you'll see that, that the path is, is named Roger Horton Way. And we did that to mark his retirement after all those years of service. And he was absolutely delighted, though. We didn't tell him why we'd invited him there. So he's really quite abashed and surprised that uh, we'd gone to that trouble. And thank you to the rail metro team for uh, for making those arrangements. Thank you. Uh, Timothy, are you going to, to speak to the, the opposition? Um, I certainly am. Um, well, first of all, I'd just like to um, um, uh, join in with your comments and those of Richard's in terms of Roger on behalf of the Conservative group. Obviously, I served with him for many years on the uh, TDC and, and predecessor committees. Um, he was he was a lovely chap, as you said. Uh, there was quite a bit of banter, if you recall, between us um, in terms of our our political differences. But it was always it was always good humoured, yeah. of very good of very good nature. We worked, I hoped, very closely together because we both had. Um, an overwhelming interest in improving public transport, but particularly rail and metro in the in the West Midlands. And I know that in terms of key policies, 
uh, I don't think there was, um, you know, like the restoration of railway lines, mm -hmm. uh, you, there was no difference. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I don't think I've got anything um, really to add to uh, to the comments um, that have already been made, save um, just as we did with Angus Adams and a permanent tribute, yes. uh, which was the plaque at Starbridge bus station. I think it'd be nice if we could put our thinking yeah. caps on and find a suitable um, um, memorial to Roger for all the work mm -hmm. uh, he's he's done on public transport in the West Midlands. And the the obvious one that came to my mind was um, something uh, at at the uh, at Wensbury Tram Depot or or potentially oh. its expansion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. given that it is in Sandwell, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is where he obviously was a councillor for for many years. And uh, as Richard um, uh, talked about earlier, uh, you know, he was always very keen on on the Metro to the extent of going up to Immingham to see the first one delivered. So um, so that would be my suggestion. Um, mm -hmm you know, for his amazing contribution over the um, over the many years. Right, well, we'll certainly raise that yeah. with officers yeah. and at the Rail and Metro um, leg, I think. Thank you for that, that suggestion. Um, David. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I knew a former councillor uh, Orton for quite a number of years. Um, we served together on the old uh, Centro uh, board years ago. I got to know him very, very well indeed. Uh, and um, we always had a very good, clean relationship, uh, which is always good to have with, 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 with members of any party. Uh, what I would like to suggest is uh, the last time I worked together with him is to get a tram named after Cyril Regis. We both campaigned very hard to get this done. And I was wondering what the possibility would be of mm -hmm. naming one after Roger, because he worked so hard of getting one for Cyril Regis. It would be really a tribute to name one after him, so he's continually running along that line. Uh, that is the one thing that I think we should be seriously looking at, mm -hmm. uh, to be perfectly truthful. But as, a, uh, as a, both elected members, both, both different, of course, authorities, it was always good to have that good relationship between us. And uh, it's a thing, it's a person I shall always have in my mind, to be perfectly truthful. Because certain places I go, the first thing that comes into mind is Roger Orton. So I really can't say any more than that. I think who has spoken has spoken very honourably uh, of Roger. And um, my contribution to the conversation would be if we could keep him running up and down that line, I think that'd be a fine tribute. Thank you. Absolutely, indeed. Pete. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you, everybody. And in terms of those comments that have been made about suggestions, then we're, we're more than happy to support and join in with the uh, thinking caps on, on this one as well. Uh, I personally was prevented from going to Councillor Horton's uh, funeral because I had the onset of uh, the, the dreaded COVID, and uh, which which was uh, hugely unfortunate. Uh, I know a lot has been said, but it's, it's rare to get a chance to say anything like this. Uh, but that's because it's rare that we find a character like Councillor Roger Horton within our midst, I think. I'm sure there's little I can say that hasn't already been said by uh, others, but I think it is worth uh, repeating to ensure that those whose lives weren't connected with him really uh, know just how in awe so many were of his sort of interest, his humour, his approach to public service, and in a way that I think is not necessarily typical within our population. And uh, we all hold our own memories of, of Roger. Uh, mine started when I joined Centro in 2006 from what was then Travel West Midlands. Uh, and I'd not been made very familiar with the Outlook system. So when Councillor Horton dropped in a meeting on his beloved 444 bus service in my first few days, I didn't even know it was there. And so when I went to meet him, when somebody pointed it out to me and he spent ages asking me about the structure of Travel West Midlands, which I thought was absolutely amazing because he was fascinated. Uh, and I took him through step by step, went through the roles and responsibilities of each layer until we got to the chief executive. Uh, and when we did, he explained to me that when it came to the 444, 
he was the chief executive and he hoped that I wouldn't miss another meeting on such an important topic uh, and, and I never did. Uh, so it was just very typically uh, who the person I came to know as Councillor Horton, uh, that was very typical of, of him. But over the years, I think his humour across all that he was passionate about became really infectious. His interests were second to none, and he often made it difficult to actually retain lines between officers and members. But that's because you wouldn't really want to reject that level of commitment and finding that level of passion in transport that he had was very difficult to say the least. And why wouldn't you welcome that into any sort of forum and group and make the most of it to get things right in terms of looking at the detail and considering it from a passenger perspective, which he always did. So I know in short, I can't find a member of staff or, or a leading figure who has anything other than good things to say uh, about Roger for his interest, his passion in everything that he did, from his role to West Coast Rail, his interest in Metro and all things rail, uh, his passion for getting the bus services right and his interest in making things better for other people in everyday life. Uh, but I think one of the things that has been touched on was in the face of adversity, who's possibly what I would call a one man human role model uh, mm. for many in terms of how positive and enthusiastic he handled whatever life threw at him. Uh, be it getting his papers in larger fonts, making a joke about his latest challenge or wanting to make sure that he still found out about other people and uh, their news and what was happening with them. So I think the only way that we could probably do Roger justice would be to talk about him all day, yes. which I know is simply isn't possible. Uh, so whilst knowing that his legacy as a friend and a colleague will live on in everybody's memories for uh, uh, the moons to come, uh, I think one word will sum up you, Roger, from Transport for West Midlands to all of you, ladies and gentlemen, and I think that is a legend. OK, yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Well said, well said. Oh, you started sparking off a few memories of my outings and, and so on with, with Roger over the years now. A bit too much for me to uh, repeat over and over. And well, thank you, everybody. And... Um, and our best wishes to Roger's family and uh, and friends over there in, in Sandwell. Thank you. Right, some chairs remarks. Um, I wanted to keep the, these brief today because we've got quite a lot on. Um, you'll notice in the minutes we were to have a briefing on the latest update on the Coventry um, electric bus city. And uh, I can just say that uh, the today that um, there's been some uh, some developments in that uh, we've agreed terms in December, agreed uh, grant terms and uh, conditions with National Express uh, and they can, they've now placed an order for the first 130 buses part of that project. They should be with with us in early uh, 2023 and uh, just waiting for them to be built and uh, power supply to the bus depot uh, upgraded and prepared for them. So there we are, some first crucial steps in that really significant uh, development for the West Midlands and especially for Coventry and the immediate area. Uh, zero emission buses, there's still no news from uh, the government on uh, the Zebra bid for uh, hydrogen buses still waiting so no update no briefing to be sent out on that until we uh, we find out what the position is um on the national express stagecoach uh, merger or should i say the takeover of uh, by um, national express of 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 stagecoach that is uh, has been announced it is progressing it looks like a minnow swallowing uh, a whale here with uh, um, National Express's 1,500 buses being joined by 6,000 buses across uh, the UK um, with, with Stagecoach. Um, waiting to see what uh, the details are going to, to, to be, how it will pan out. And of course, uh, what the Competition and Markets Authority um, make of it at all um but so uh, we expect to hear more uh, as we go through into the year and of course the impact it will have on our bus delivery and uh, uh, bus recovery and so on uh, 
across the West Midlands. Um, and just a final reminder, as if you didn't, as if you didn't need it, uh, there's uh, fewer than 20 days to go before the Commonwealth Games. Um, so we should all be focusing on that. And I think looking at the reports later on for us and for the combined authority, that's certainly going to be the case. So thank you for that. Let us move on to the minutes of the 15th of November. Can we agree them as being accurate? Was there an accuracy point you wanted to make, Richard? Um, I, 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 just the very final point about the date of the next meeting. I don't oh, yeah. know. If we, I don't know, uh, item 37, I don't know if we agreed to hold our meeting at two o'clock, but it, <laughs> we're meeting at one o'clock now. That might have been dating back to the days when we, yeah. we met in person and the room had to be scrubbed. In advance so that, of may, our that may be an error, it may not. It's okay. uh, only a minor point, we're all here. Well, I don't think all. anyone's going to turn up at two o'clock. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, any other comments on the accuracy? Chair, sorry, can I just make a quick point? Yep. Um, some of the actions that are noted in there in terms of uh, briefing notes, um, what I what I have done is I have chased those and I'll compile, compile an action log and send that out separately to members, just so there's a track of all the action notes and um, of the briefing notes that were requested in that meeting. OK, yes, yeah, so the Zebra, uh, of course, isn't uh, av yet available. Thank you. Um, OK, any matters arising? There's item five. Matters arising? Well, we await Tanya's compendium of briefings. Is there anything else? No. Nope. Nope. OK, let's move. Move on. Uh, the forward plan. We have inserted rail freight and the University and Perry Bar Station um, items that were suggested last time into February and March respectively. Any other comments on that? Okay, just move forward. Um, right, here are our business items for consideration. Uh, item seven, uh, financial monitoring report. Uh, Pervez, do you want to lead off on this please? Thank you, thank you Madam Chairman. This is the financial monitoring report reporting year-to-date income and expenditure up to 30th November 2021. Key points to note from the report are as to revenue position, the year-to-date revenue position to 30th November 2021 reflects an overall favourable position of £2.9 million. Pounds. The primary driver for this continues to be savings in the concession budget due to the continued impact of the pandemic being both a reduced service and patronage. There have also been no fare increases. Other savings are largely as reported in previous months. These savings are offset by lower than budgeted use of reserves year to date to support the overall budget as these have not yet been required. These year to date savings are expected to offset budgeted support to operators to deal with ongoing impact and the recovery from COVID-19, which has been built into the forecast. Madam Chairman, as to capital expenditure, Overall year-to-date capital expenditure to the end of November 2021 is £182.2 million, pounds, which is £72.7 million pounds behind year-to-date budget of £254.9 million. Pounds. The key variances are in the investment program portfolio, which is £44.5 million, pounds, and Commonwealth Games program, which is 14 million pounds. The five key drivers of the overall variances are number one, within the investment program variations, which is divided into investment program variation A and B. Number one A is Birmingham East Side Metro Extension, which is 16.1 million pounds favorable. 
due, due to rescheduling of project program and payment profile for utility diversion into next financial year. 1B, Wensbury to Briley Hill Metro extension, which is 14.5 million pound favorable due to rescheduling of utility work. Number two, Commonwealth Games program includes all the schemes scheduled, scheduled, scheduled to be delivered in advance of the games in July and August 2022. At the end of November, Actual costs total 81.6 million pounds. The main driver of the year to date underspend is the sprint program, which are 20.5 million pounds behind year to date budget. Both programs are now seeing accelerated work with no expected impact on completion dates. This underspend is offset by accelerated drawdown of funding for the Alexander Stadium redevelopment of 12.2 million pounds. Number three, other major schemes expenditure at the end of November was 9.6 million pounds below budget. The main variance relates to cross city bus city center package. Number four, Grants to local authorities expenditure at the end of November was 2.6 million pounds below budget. This variance relates to the B4106 fund and works, where the acquisition of properties has been rephased into later in the year. Madam Chairman, number five, minor work program spend is 2 million pounds below budget year-to-date due to lower-than-expected claims from local authorities. And with that, over to Kate. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, Kate. Yeah. No further comments, Chair Rosa, from um, Councillor Attar's excellent briefing on there, but obviously willing to take any um, questions, yes. um, so maybe from members. Any comments or questions, please, from members? No. Really? No? Okay. Oh, thank you both for that. Shut off light in there. Yeah. Um, right. Capital Programme Delivery Monitoring Report, item eight. Thank Over. you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Obviously, I would like to present the Capital Programme Delivery Monitoring Report. This uh, committee is recommended to note achievements since, since November meeting of TDC also to know the progress of deliverable and outturn of the 2021-22 capital program and to note where indicated any variations from the baseline program. Madam Chairman, while there has been a more positive lookout through the COVID-19 vaccination program, we are keeping a close eye on the rapid recent rapid increases in the number of infections and the risk that this poses to the ongoing delivery of our capital program. The following achievements have been completed during November and December. Number one, delivery deadly interchange. Following the tender evaluation process, a lead contractor has been identified. Number two, making the key route network safer successfully agreed the repositioning of recently planted tree with BCC to increase the sight line for drivers entering the A38 Bristol Road in Edgbaston. Number three is Parry Bar Rail Station and Bus Interchange. Positive progress on site at the rail station continues with topping out of the station marked on 17th November. Number four is West Midland Cycle Hire. Launch of e-bikes took place on 8th December 2021, with 150 e-bikes now avail available across the scheme. The committee should note the following exception during the reporting period. Network-wide park and ride expansion development. Phase two program on hold due to COVID plus the resultant lower demand for park and ride. 
Madam Chairman, uh, I will now hand over to Sandeep. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Akhtar. Um, as always, Councillor Akhtar's picked up all the salient points, so happy to take any questions um, from the committee. OK, I have uh, David was first. David? Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm sorry about that. I'm having a bit of a problem with the technical side of things here this afternoon. Uh, the comment I'd like to make is referring to page 22, um, 3.1. Uh, it goes to the Dudley Interchange. One of the things that's concerning me about this is the length of time it's taking the Metro on Castle Hill, which is having serious disruption with the town centre itself in Dudley. I should hate to see that both these programmes would take place at the same time. I think it's better to get one sorted out before the other because it would cause a lot of disruption within Dudley to have the Castle Hill partly being used at the same time uh, the bus station being closed and having to relocate the buses in the process. As you know, it's very tightly confined up there at the present moment, and the area I'm talking about is side by side. So we're not talking about a lot of difference between the two, but Castle Hill being only being half used with the Metro, uh, with its future unknown at the moment, uh, the work isn't progressing there as well as I would have expected to have been. I went down there last week to have a look what it was looking like, and it didn't seem any different to the last time I was down there a month ago. But having said that, it's just my major concern that the traders in the town are suffering currently, and a lot of it is because of getting in and out of the town, especially in that direction in Castle Hill. So I think that we should give some consideration before we make any commencement or any start on the interchange in Dudley that we get Castle Hill sorted out first. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor Stanley. So uh, I can assure you that there is um, an awful lot of coordination that goes on with the Metro delivery team in terms of those programmes, and there has been for a while to make sure that we are minimising the impact on the highway network as a result of those works coming into delivery. Now that will continue. There has been a coordination of those programmes. Um, we engage regularly with the MMA around the delivery of that, so we will continue to do that. And obviously we'll be working alongside our colleagues in network resilience to manage and mitigate the impacts of any delivery of um, of Dudley Interchange itself. We are still working through that overall delivery program. Whilst we have identified um, the primary contractor, we will still need to work through the contractor's program for the actual delivery, and we are working very closely with Dudley uh, offices on that as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tim. Um, thank you very much. I've got um, 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 several questions. If we go to number seven, network wide park and ride um, expansion developments, I'm slightly amused at the last sentence, or I should say bemused. Further detail was set out in the park and ride update, which was presented to TDC in February. Um, in February, are we talking That's February 2021, or are we talking about January as in this meeting um, because I'm completely bemused by that but the substantive point is that um, the we the the the, uh, the summary relates to Minworth um, park and ride which is being taken forward I'm assuming this is in anticipation of the sprint route uh, that we would like to set up along the a38 north between Birmingham City Centre and Sutton via Langley. At the last Sprint Meg, as is recorded in uh, later on in the agenda, I did ask Sprint officers to speak to um, uh, my colleagues on Birmingham City Council that represent Warmley and Minworth Ward, uh, because I know they have concerns about the route and wanted more details about the park and ride. Do we know if any of that has occurred uh, um, since the meeting of the Sprint Meg? Um, because I think uh, that would be important uh, as part of the development of the park and ride. And in terms of um, the University Station number five, uh, it says um, following project re, uh, re baselining 
The project continues to work with DFT Network Rail and other partners to identify potential funding solutions. Um, we're, we're talking about this being completed uh, in August 2022 on the baseline assessment, and we're still speaking to stakeholders regarding potential funding solutions. Could we have a bit more detail about that? Yeah. Because these uh, these discussions will need to be um, concluded very shortly for us to meet the baseline date. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Huxtable. So in terms of Minworth, there is some feasibility work that is being undertaken around um, a potential park and ride facility at Minworth, and that would tie into um, any sort of future expansion of the Sprint network that serves the A38 corridor. Now, there have been um, Notwithstanding the conversations that have happened at MEG, there have been a number of conversations that have been held with councillors from um, Warmley and Minworth around the routes, and we're well aware of those concerns, and we will continue to engage with them on that as we take any further development work forward. So I'm not sure if there's been any direct uh, conversations following the MEG meeting, which I'm guessing was in December, but I will pick that up with the team. In terms of um, university station, sorry, Park and ride. Let me go back to park and ride. So that one refers mm. to February 21, because that's when a paper came to TDC, which basically set out the approach for for park and ride oh, until we see a, a significant change in the demand for park and ride facilities. Um, other than some of that high level feasibility work that is ongoing. So it is I know there is a, a further update um, which sort of picks up the most recent position as well that is coming forward, um, but that was um, it wasn't aware at the time that that update was produced back in December. So when it refers to February, it does refer to the position back in February 21. Now, in terms of University Station, and there's been a number of conversations about this, and we've spoken in the past about enhanced scope and enhanced um, uh, facilities that could be provided. Whilst there is an overall funding solution that is in place, there are other areas that there has been ongoing conversations around funding for um, which would actually enhance the facility. But in terms of the core facility that is funded and there is a programme for that to be completed this year. So that's what that comment refers to. And I'll also draw the fact to the committee that there is a bit of a lag in when these reports are produced, the updates come forward and when the papers go out to what happens in the intervening period. So if that has caused any confusion, then apologies. Thank you. Uh, any other, any follow up or further questions? No? No. OK, well, thank you. Uh, thank you both for that. Uh, let us move on to item nine, the rail business report. Richard. OK, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to introduce it as set out and uh, Tom, I think you're doing the honours. Um, is there anything you want to uh, highlight here before we ask for questions? Uh, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Chair. Um, th there's probably four um, key things that I'd like to uh, to pick out, and I will keep them at, at a high level. Appreciate everyone's had the report and had had time to uh, to read it, so I won't just repeat it back to you. Um, it has been a while since I think I last presented. Um, about six months or so, I imagine. Has quite a lot that has happened actually since then. Um, probably the most significant change uh, for the West Midlands has been that the, the West Midlands Trains franchise formally expired uh, in September, 18th of September, and it was replaced by a directly awarded National Rail contract, NRC. And uh, it, quite a significant shift in approach to the contracting of rail services in the, in the West Midlands. The most uh, sort of glaring difference, I suppose, is that cost and revenue risk is now with the Department for Transport. And what we're going to see is over time, as other franchises uh, expire either earlier or their previously specified expiry dates, they too will be replaced by these national rail contracts. So West Midlands is the first. Chiltern subsequently followed on the 31st of uh, December. And these contracts are bridging contracts to what the Department of Transport are calling passenger service contracts or PSCs that will eventually um, be the vehicle by which many of the William Shapps recommendations are implemented. Um, so we are still waiting the, the publication of a schedule, a pipeline, if you will, of 
uh, replacements of these NRCs with, with PSCs. Um, suspect in the case of West Midlands trains, it will be 2024 at the earliest or possibly 2026 at the, at the latest for that to happen to our local operator. Uh, the contract term for the NRC does allow either to 24 or to 26. So we do have that feasibility and that flexibility built into, uh, into the arrangements. Now, because of the cost and revenue risk shifting from the private sector to the Department of Transport, it has, of course, meant that there has been considerable focus on uh, realising efficiencies uh, from West Midlands Trains operation. Now, of course, uh, those costs are 100 percent by the department and by extension, the Treasury and, and taxpayers. So there were a number of things um, that had been expected to be delivered under the previous franchise that unfortunately weren't carried over into the National Rail contract. Um, but pleasingly, uh, some of the main customer transformational elements were so the new trains, for example, diesels and uh, and electrics uh, and depot facilities to, of course, house and uh, and maintain them. So that's National Rail contracts. Um, I'll touch next on train crew. Um, in terms of the operational performance of the network, train crew has probably been the biggest challenge that West Midlands trains and other operators, for that matter, have faced. Uh, for West Midlands trains, the problem is particularly acute for the same reasons that caused the deterioration of performance back in 2019, for those of you who were involved in rail uh, then. West Midlands trains have over 100 trainee drivers in the pipeline that eventually, once they qualify, uh, address that shortfall. Um, but because of the pandemic and the loss of around six months in training time, those drivers are not yet, all of them, uh, productive. Once they are productive, that will bridge the uh, the gap um, and we should have uh, a local operator who's uh, fully resourced to deliver the, the timetable, but we won't get there yet. Um, likely it'll be uh, late summer, early autumn by the time that that training has uh, completed. And it was this absence of uh, the right number of train drivers that did cause quite a, a, a significant deterioration in train operational performance in October last year, coincided with a half term where, of course, there's reduced appetite for rest day work and overtime and increased appetite for annual leave. So it creates a, a downward pressure on those already quite scarce resources. Um, I'll, I'll stick with COVID. Um, it's hard to avoid it, of course. We're currently experiencing very high levels of train crew related absence on all the rail operators serving the, the region. Uh, West Midlands trains um, have had to make some very short notice alterations to their timetables. Um, services between Birmingham and Birmingham International uh, have ceased operation from today. Um, that's the local service. The, the other more longer distance trains, of course, still still operate as do trains by Avanti and uh, cross country. And also, unfortunately, the, the service between Nuneaton, Coventry and Leamington, the knuckle line has also um, been removed. Um, these are only temporary measures um, until uh, the 26th of February or earlier if uh, the pandemic uh, allows. Um, but it was a, a reminder of the fact that there, there is still um, quite a lot of vulnerability in, in the train companies at the moment to spikes um, connected to, uh, to the pandemic. And then the final thing, a big announcement uh, that was made just before we, we broke up, uh, was the publication of the IRP, the, uh, the Integrated uh, Rail Plan. Um, and I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the contents uh, of that. Um, there was some good news and also some some news that uh, we would prefer to go uh, a different way. Uh, I think the good news was that um, many aspects of the Midlands uh, Rail Hub uh, were endorsed by uh, by the rail plan. Uh, and in particular, it supported the, the focus on improving services to Worcester and Hereford and improving access to, uh, to HS2 from Bristol and Cardiff. So I suppose that would manifest itself on the ground via the southwest uh, Bordesley Cord into Moore Street Station. However, the IRP did also note that the new high speed line to the East Midlands could realise many of the benefits of the Midlands Rail Hub Eastern section by providing improved connectivity from the West Midlands to Nottingham and potentially yeah. service frequency to Derby. So that does place some question marks over the cords on the other side of the station, the, the South East um, Bordesley cords. Uh, and of course, from a wider strategic uh, rail standpoint, um, our preference would be for all of those things to, uh, to be delivered. And the IRP doesn't mean that they won't be. It just means that um, we will have to work with Midlands uh, Connect uh, and with Network Rail and the Department of Transport to identify other mechanisms for, for delivering those uh, extra bits of infrastructure that have not been endorsed through the, the IRP. 
And then a final thing, uh, whilst we're on the subject of infrastructure, and we have just been talking about it, um, the rail programme um, continues at great pace at the moment, delivering university and Perry Bar. Uh, and also there are works underway on package one, which is Walsall to Wolverhampton stations, also package two, Camp Hill line uh, connectivity. Um, so it's great to see uh, a lot of the, the metal work uh, flying up at so the two stations where work's underway and it's also good to see the progress that's been made behind the scenes um, so that we'll be hopefully soon in a position to be able to start doing the same on the uh, the five new stations and that's I'll leave it there uh, Richard. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Um, okay uh, Chris unless Richard Richard your hand's still up did you want to come back? No sorry legacy. Okay I right, talk so Chris Hi there, thanks. Um, thanks, Richard, for presenting it and Tom for your really detailed um, sort of discussion. I've got three um, three key questions actually coming from this. Um, if we look at page 37 in the agenda pack that we got, we noticed that we've had a failure on all counts to secure any money through the uh, Restoring Your Railway Fund. Yeah. Um, however, in a separate cover circulated to um, the WMCA board, it looks like we may pursue using some of our cross funding to try and open train stations in that way. I would question whether this is a wide use of money for as we failed to hit the, you know, the required mm -hmm. requirements to restore on the restore your railways fund technol, yeah. is that technol for instance technol is my big one that i don't think we could deliver value for money for the taxpayer with when we could duplicate it better with a bus for instance is it worth pursuing our very very limited crust funding on things that have already been rejected by the government they have been rejected for a reason not just arbitrarily um and also can you feed back on why we were rejected in those fronts mm -hmm. um yeah. i've also got secondary question sorry on the introduction of the new rolling stock i understand that training has been pushed back so it's not a shock that also the introduction of new rolling stock has been pushed back but when can we expect to see some of that in service on the network um because so as as lots of us know lots of this rolling stock actually has a higher standing capacity which if we were using this would have alleviated some of the issues of we're running fewer services but we could have carried more people on those fewer services, for instance. Mm -hmm. And then my final one is, is a comment on the IRP. I've spoken with some industry experts on this one. Um, and it's what it's one of the few things where industry experts have contacted me on it as well. And and realistic, they they have taken a much less diplomatic view than you have to as an officer. And I do respect your position <laughs> as an officer. But what we've seen is that. Previously, the Midlands Rail Hub, in all press releases, in all formalistic conversations about it, we were using words like will be, will have, and we're using very definite words. They have now moved to maybe and could be. We've seen a dramatic linguistic railing back of the language to do with Midlands Rail Hub. Can you explain that? And also something else that I just want to pick up is we're talking about the benefits that could be delivered from it. I talk about HS2 and saying that they will be released in 2040, potentially for the region. Now, that's that's quite a dramatic climb down from a previously stated year. Of course, I know that was in the past of 2026. And then it, it, it feeds back into what you said, that there's also this concerning strand where they're saying that a high speed um, East Midlands connection could also achieve some of the things that the Midlands Rail had planned to do. But I, I don't see how that would necessarily be feasible. Sorry that that was a bombardment of questions. <laughs> wow. But well, there's... Do Does what you can, concerns? Tom. Um, <laughs> if, if you need to, you could do it as a supplementary briefing. But let's see how you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. um, so I'll, I'll start. I'll start at the beginning, and that's going okay, with uh, restoring your railway and the question of um, crusts. Um, so I'm not privy to the exact details of why those schemes were unsuccessful. Um, I do know, however, that of course it was a competitive. Uh, process and there were applications from all across the country so um, I don't think we I, I, it might be too soon for us to jump to the conclusion that because it was rejected through restoring a railway that didn't meant it was a worthy scheme it might have meant that there were just other schemes nationwide that happened to have an even more compelling uh, case um, but I say that without having seen the detailed feedback from the Department for Transport which of course may say something uh, to uh, to the contrary but I don't think it, it does um, on the second point around the new rolling stock, um, we're very hopeful that train crew training permitting, of course, and that is at the mercy of, of the, the pandemic, uh, we will see the 
diesel multiple unit trains, the class 196s, out in traffic uh, later this year, hopefully um, in sort of late spring, early summer. And um, of course, they will be introduced incrementally, so we won't see them appear all in, in one go. It's likely they'd start on the Shrewsbury services first and, first and foremost, because that's um, from an operational perspective, an easier route to diagram them on requires fewer drivers to be trained, in other words, um, to enter those into service there. And then it would likely follow on to the, um, the services on the Hereford route after that. Uh, and then once the station constructed, of course, Camp Hill would be another service that would be um, provided for by the 196s. The 730s are at a less advanced stage of their construction, so I think it's unlikely that we're going to see them in passenger traffic this year, um, but certainly from early next year would be the expectation. And again, they would be introduced in an incremental um, phased approach. I believe the intention again for train crew operational reasons would be on the services between uh, Walsall uh, and Wolverhampton. And then when enough uh, are available and enough drivers have been trained up, then they'd start running on the, the more high intensity cross city line route. And then the third and final one around the, the language used by Midlands Connect, it's probably something I'm, I'm not qualified to comment on, given that that's a, a Midlands Connect rather than a West Midlands Rail Executive uh, matter. But I'm, I'm happy to um, take that away and speak to, to colleagues at, at Midlands Connect and, and ask them to liaise with you directly, uh, directly Councillor Burden on um, what their current scale of uh, ambition is and what that language uh, may be trying to communicate, if, if that would be um, acceptable. Yes. 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 Thank you, Tom. Thank, thank you for that detailed answer. And that's for everybody. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. OK, uh, ready for the next question. That's Tim. Uh, thank you. Um, and, and again, questions rather than question. Um, the, the, the first one is 3.2 on page 30 of the report. Um, could we um, could we have um, a um, sort of third briefing report on um, the priority station for Kings Norton and uh, Snow Hill and capacity enhancements as part of the Midland Rail Hub. Um, because if I recall in the command paper, um, the IRP command paper, they were specifically named check as, as part of the MHR section of the, of the command paper. So there seems to be, uh, for the first time, a willingness and an appetite for um, for uh, such such passenger enhancements, which is to be welcomed. And indeed, looking at the map on in the command paper, um, there was the um, South Western Borsley Court actually marked on the map of the command paper between pages 118 and 120 if I recall correctly, and yet the map in the report doesn't actually show that very crucial and important link in the West Midlands, which is slightly disappointing in terms of the report being presented to, to this committee. I understand the reasons why, but, um, you know, from the West Midlands, I would imagine that it's far more important that a multi-million pound link uh, is, is shown as a key objective rather than um, uh, some of the enhancements and improvements proposed on the map we see in, in 3.3 um, and, the, and the core network. Um, my, my understanding, just to pick up a further point, is that uh, the command paper, the IRP command paper, actually shows that not only would um, uh, delivery between the East Midlands, specifically Derby and Nottingham, would be done much quicker than the high speed to Eastern link to Birmingham um, and Birmingham interchange, but there would be far more direct connectivity um, through East Midlands Parkway than the proposed high speed two station at Norton. So again, um, something I think that um, is, is, is very much to be welcomed if we can reduce those journey times because we've always said where Birmingham is very good in terms of north south link, uh, mm -hmm. east west links could be substantially improved. Mm -hmm. And with the southwest and Bordesley cord, that's thought out one of our issues with the southwest and with the journey time improvements of the new eastern leg 
of high speed two. That improved journey times between Birmingham and uh, Derby and Nottingham. And just to uh, question a, a further thing, um, I believe that there's also a paper being written regarding the um, the rail vision that the regional mayor has in terms of the West Midlands. And uh, where are we with that in terms of um, looking at the West Midlands rail network as a whole uh, in the light of uh, everything that you've described in this paper and how we take forward some of these schemes? And finally, my understanding is that the Honeybourne link, a part of the Restoring Your Railway plan, was successful and did get funded. And that obviously links into Stratford Pun Avon and the Snow Hill line. And what implications does that have for the West Midlands um, in terms of both connectivity and additional services? Thank you very much, Chair. There we are. Wow. It's rail day, isn't it, today? <laughs> um, Tom. <laughs> Right, yeah, so I'll just, just very quickly plug in my laptop because I've just spotted my, my battery is oh. slow and I would hate to get cut off halfway through, but that, that's, that's got it. Um, yeah. Actually, no, thank, thank you, Tim. Um, lots of uh, sort of very detailed questions as, uh, as usual, which I thank you for. Starting off um, with the Kings Norton, Birmingham, Snow Hill. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'll ask uh, Peter and Toby if they can um, pull together a, a briefing note on that subject and uh, explaining um, what is different for those post the uh, the IRP potentially making available that up to 1.5 million uh, billion I should say actually as referenced in the the report um, on the second point around uh, how some of the information is depicted for the IRP completely take on board your feedback I'll be the first person to accept that the the report is a little bit wordy sometimes so there's probably more we can convey um, using images like the ones you described um, so uh, I, I'm the person who edits the report so I'll, I'll take that away and I'll try and make it um, a little less dense with words and uh, and a little bit more um, illustrated um, if that would okay. benefit yourself and others as well at yeah. TDC. Uh, on the third point about the command um, paper. Um, as I mentioned in the my verbal update, um, you know, we, we still believe, um, as I think you do by the sounds of things, that there are definite advantages um, to the delivery of that eastern section of the, the Midlands Rail Hub. So just because it's not been endorsed through the IRP doesn't mean that um, we've given up on it and Midlands Connect have given up on it for that for that matter. So discussions have already kicked off with Midlands Connect, with Network Rail and the DFT um, about developing a more um, holistic strategic case for rail network capacity um, on those corridors, mm. uh, which goes beyond Midlands Connect uh, original objectives, um, because I think what the IRP has demonstrated is that we need to um, provide some additional hooks uh, to demonstrate why this is going to realise the benefits that I think we all do believe it uh, it does. So that's something that likes of Peter Sargent and, and Toby Ratcliffe have been uh, in the uh, in the lead on. I can make that something that we home in on in greater detail um, when we come to uh, to next submit one of our reports, if that would be a benefit. Yes. Oh, thank you. Good. And the, the final question, I think there's a question about a um, a, pair, a paper that's being or a, a prospectus um, possibly for the for the mayor on rail. That's not something that I've been involved in, so I'm not able to comment on that. But I can take it away and speak to uh, to Malcolm, who I'm sure would be involved in it if it was something that um, was happening and was a WMR ETF WM activity at the moment. Uh, I think Toby as well. Toby, of course. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and Honeybourne? Oh, apologies. Yes, Honeybourne. Um, so I think Honeybourne, it was a very, very interesting scheme. I was actually at Stratford-upon-Avon on, uh, on Friday and it's rather tantalising when you see the tracks snake off under the uh, under the bridge. And of course, you know that they only go on for another 100, uh, 100 yards or so. Um, and it's not that bit uh, big a gap that needs to be bridged. Um, however, it, we are still a long way off, I think, in terms of restoring services. Uh, on that uh, on that route, uh, there's an awful lot of work that would need to happen south of Stratford-upon-Avon. Uh, um, I believe the alignment has been largely built on, actually. So it would be a, a very very difficult 
uh, reopening. That's not to say impossible, but I think it would be very, very difficult. Um, and I think, therefore, in terms of the priorities for the region, it's probably currently lower down than some of the other ones that are both uh, more realistic to deliver within current timescales and funding provisions, um, but also um, deliver a, a greater degree of benefit. Now, the final thing I'll say on that, though, is that in light of everything that has changed in the economy and with travel patterns, the Westminster Rail Executive Rail Investment Strategy is being uh, recast. Uh, so that's something that Peter Sargent is uh, is in the lead on. Um, so I think there'll be a, a number of changes to what we believe the right investment priorities for the region are as a consequence of factoring in those different economic and social environments. Where Honeybourne will feature in that, I think it's too early to say. OK, thank you. Uh, Robert. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Richard and um, Tom, for your presentation there. Um, I think Tim's raised some good points about what was um, missing in the report and could, we could do with picking up going forward. Um, in terms of the restoring railway bids, Tom, I think your point about just because something was rejected doesn't mean actually that it's, it's not viable. There are other factors as well, I think is a really important one to, to bear in mind. Um, and that no doubt is partly behind the push um, for new stations like the Techno one to, to come forward. Um, looking particularly at the new section, new station section in the report, section nine, um, it's numbered 7.1 to 7.3, but I assume it's going to be 9.1 to 9.3. The new stations in North Birmingham at Castle Bromwich um, and at the Fort Pathway are really key. Um, if we're going to be able to both in, improve public transport in the north of the city, but also improve access to employment opportunities in an area that um, suffers from far higher unemployment rates than the country as a whole. Um, these are really important things to be able to get in place. And so um, I welcome the fact that they're still in there and still being worked on. Um, but I think if there's anything that, that this committee and regional partners can do, both to help try and increase the chances, but also to ensure that other things um, that take place don't impact on the ability for those stations to come in later. Uh, I think that's really important messages to get out to people. Thank you. Okay, any further comments? Okay, right, well, thank you all for uh, questions and Richard and Tom. We will now move along a bit. Um, thank you. To the park and ride. Anyone else there? Sorry. It's stuck. Um, OK, item 10, park and ride update report. I think it's pleasing to see that work has been carrying on since the, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic caused really the delays in making a meaningful start on the combined authorities request for um, uh, complete park and ride strategic uh, um, 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 Review. Um, okay, is it Pete or Andy who's going to? It's going to be me, Chair. Oh, um, oh you're fine. Sorry, 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 sorry. And Andy was going to do it, but unfortunately, he's had to go to a funeral this afternoon, so oh, no. uh, he can't. He can't be with us. So uh, he's asked me to to step into the breach and uh, you know update uh, you and your colleagues on on where we are with park and ride. Um, do you want me to take go through do some salient points through the report, or yes. how do you want me to take? Yeah, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, um, obviously we take it that uh, members have obviously read the they read the report. But if I can sort of draw your attention to a few things in in the report, just so that we're 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 yeah. all aware of things. Um, I suppose the thing to, to to sort of really really pick up on is the fact, obviously, we've had a major impact from from coronavirus on um, usage of our park and rides and so forth. And uh, since March of of, of 2020, um, we've not actually seen um, usage of any of our car or our average use of our car parks exceed anything like 50% in the whole of that time. Now, pre-COVID, as, as many of you know, we were running at 100% basically. Um, the only car parks that weren't full were usually Bescott, uh, uh, Bescott Stadium. Every other car park that we'd got were, was actually full. So um, that's that's a quite a significant thing we've had since since March of, of, of 2020. And just looking at figures today, um, we're running at an average of 28% of occupancy across the estate today. So, um, you know, the usage has significantly fallen yeah. over, over that over that period. So that's probably one thing to, to, to take into account. Um, 
Obviously, a positive thing we've done since since we last reported, we've um, opened our new car park down at Longbridge. Finally, um, 627 car parking spaces down there. Um, unfortunately, um, usage there is nowhere near what we would expect, uh, have been expecting. We were, we were sort of predicting sort of 100, 150 probably in the first year. Um, we're lucky to get up to, I think 40 is the most we've actually got on any one day at the moment in there. But, um, you know, we, 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 you know, the car park's there, it's available. We as officers think that it's it's got a very good role in, in, in resilience. Um, it's it's likely to play a, a role potentially with, with the Commonwealth Games, with be giving people an opportunity to be able to park and ride for, for some of the events and so forth. So it has some positives there, but um, nevertheless, it's it's obviously not um, getting the usage that perhaps we'd 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 hoped as as as, as when we actually started building the thing. Coming on to sort of scheme developments and so forth, um, we're continuing with with Tile Hill as the as the um, um, reports of outlines, and we're continuing to work with um, with with Coventry officers, and we're hopeful through the cross process that we may well get some more funding there to actually help us help us develop that scheme and perhaps potentially take it forward in some sort of form. Um, the other sort of stuff we've been looking at, um, Dudley Port as well, we've been we've been looking at that and, and again we're hopeful that there might be some money in, in crust for that to be able to help oh. us take that forward. Um, and then in Soli Hall, um, we, we're continuing to look at the options for Whitlock's End with, with officers at, at Soli Hall and we're also continuing to look at the, the options that we've got at um, Alton to potentially do some sort of low low cost um, work there where basically we convert some blue badge parking into 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 normal parking and then move the blue badge parking onto onto the highway to actually release some capacity in in, in that car park so that's something we, we're continuing to to actively look at with, with officers at, at Surly Hall and we're hopeful that we, we potentially be able to deliver that fairly quickly um, the other positive thing um, to talk about is the the leases that we that were expiring with our network rail leases that were expiring in March. We've got a series of some of our car park leases were expiring in March. Um, we've now got verbal agreement that we can we can actually continue those those leases probably as they are at the moment. And as as Tom was alluding to in his report about the new arrangements with the way um, car, uh, the way rail industry is likely to be managed in the future, the likelihood is those leases are probably going to have some sort of break clauses put in them so that when when they when we finally know what the rail industry is going to look like going forward, then that will allow us to be able to decide how we actually manage our car parks and so forth going forward with that. Um, and I think that is all that I had to um, sort of update members on other than what is in the report. Okay, thank right. you. I see there's some questions already coming. Yes, up. I can see. <laughs> oh. I'll be your first. Thank you, Chair, oh. um, and, and thank you for that, Guy. Um, I, I was very interested in a couple of things because you referred to page 43, uh, item 4.13, acknowledging the work that Solihull does with Transport for West Midlands, both at Wittox and Station, and of course, at my world here in Alton. Mm. Um, I was pleased to hear you say, uh, and I think I'm quoting you um, regarding that, move forward but potentially fairly quickly. I assume you're referring to Alton in that. Yes. But of yes. course, none of the two things, whether it be Alton or Whitlock's End, are going to come to fruition if the uh, if funding is not built into the budget, can I ask, has funding be, been built into the budget? One for Whitlock's End and secondly for Alton. The the taking the Alton one first. Um, 
that's the, that's what we're working with 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 officers at Soli Hall on, and the likelihood is that because some of it is going to be fairly low cost to do, like relining the car park and things, some of that can be absorbed within maintenance budgets within from from TFWM's point of view. So, actually, delivering the Alton Park uh, um, scheme is probably going to be fairly easy for us to do because it's 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 a matter of relining car parks and 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 things like that. So that that's something that we can absorb into to, to normal maintenance processes. Um, with Whitlock's End, you're quite right um, that um, we can't take that much further until we we can identify some some funding sources and so forth for that. Um, the, the the problem we've got with Whitlock's End is that we own the land potentially that we could expand the car park into, but the reality is if we actually expand the car park, then we've got to do something with the arrangements um, of how you actually access that car park. And that's the costly part because we're likely to either have to put a new entrance into the car park, traffic lights. It's even been talked about a traffic island even that we might have to put in. So, so the actual costs of actually expanding that car park are quite, quite significant. So it would need us finding a package of, of measures to actually be able to deliver that. Uh, can I come back, Kath, please? Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, thank you, Guy. Um, Fully accept what you've you've said. Really pleased from a personal and ward point of view um, that you might be able to do Alton under within the maintenance uh, budget. Um, naturally, uh, as the ward councillor, the question has to be when. <laughs> that's that's what we're talking about with 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 colleagues at at, at at Soli Hall. Yeah, that's the bit we've just what we're trying to what we've done is we know in principle what we need to do in the car park potentially, which is just relining the car park and, and, and releasing some spaces so that we can provide more, you know, non blue badge parking. It's what we actually do on street. And essentially what we're planning to do there potentially is take one of the out of use bus stops out and convert that to some blue badge parking. And it's actually coming up with a, a scheme that we can do on the highway. And then obviously there's the various road orders and things that would need to happen behind the scenes to allow that to happen. So it, the, the bit on the car park is fairly easy for us to do, and we could do that fairly quickly, but it's 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 actually delivering the, the, the on-street part of it to, to actually make that work. But we've been talking with with colleagues at, at Soli Hall and, you know, from the highways team and so forth. So, you know, there is an ongoing dialogue there as to, to trying to actually push that forward because we're, we're quite conscious. It's something, it's quite a quick win that, you know, the two parties could quite easily deliver fairly quickly. Uh, I'm already privy to the uh, proposals uh, yeah. as well, Councillor, as, as I'm sure you yeah, might, might uh, yeah. understand, um, uh, and and yes, it is a quick win at minimal cost, um, uh, uh, and it's appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you. And and actually, Alton is one of the car parks that's actually quite is it relatively is quite full. Actually, it's it's you know I, I you know I alluded to this sort of fifty percent maximum. Oh, that's an, an average across the estate, and actually, Alton is one of those car parks that has oh, actually nice. does actually see a little bit more. I would suggest oh, it's an average, right. mm, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We... Okay, Chris. Hello, thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a couple of questions on item 10. Um, when we look at the um, sort of the delivery programme earlier, it says that we're putting a hold on park and ride schemes and it doesn't give a date for when they might be released. But it is interesting to note that we have detailed park and ride schemes in the cross application so at what point will we be recommencing with our park and ride sort of programs because uh, unless i've misread it it does say that they're on hold um at parts of it and i've also been speaking with a resident from longbridge i don't know why they've got in contact with me but they've <laughs> chosen to get in contact with me about it and they've said what what are the factors that really detail that sort of when we look at longbridge 10 percent is a wild underuse was it built too big have we misanticipated how people might want to use it or actually they suggested has it been poorly advertised to local residents and poorly advertised through signage on the roads when you're actually there is it correctly signposted around the town saying look there is a big park and ride here what's what's the fundamental issue that's got it at 10 percent over the last six months because that's uh, 
I mean, as you said, Guy, it's underperforming what you expected. Yeah, yeah. And that's not just the pandemic, because I've driven past Priestfield on the Metro. I've driven past Rowley Regis on there. And they are higher than this. That is a really particularly low one, that there is something outside of the pandemic that's causing that. What what, what could yeah, the rationale yeah. be there? I, I, think... I always understood that Longbridge was going to be one of the safer space a project and electric charging yes yeah that's really 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 done that down hasn't it yeah okay guy yeah 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 chair there there is saver space there and there is electric charging there we we did install those as part of the 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 scheme so they are there um the 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 difference the, the thing with longbridge is that um we have got user charging there and that's probably the thing that at the moment, because there is capacity at the likes of Northfield, Kings Norton, Selly Oak Station car parks, oh. which are free of charge, then users are, are consciously, we mm-hmm. think, making a decision to go to the free car park before they actually go to a car park where they have to pay. And in fact, during the uh, the pandemic, we actually did see um a fall in the usage at bromsgrove which is another charge for car park and it was quite obvious from the way the usage at northfield kings norton and selly oak were, were performing that what we were actually getting there were people that would have normally parked at bromsgrove actually driving to oh, either right. northfield kings norton and selly oak because they knew they could get a car parking space they don't so, live in our area either, yeah, do so they? there is some unintended consequences with some of this that and and and, and that's and the, the problem, as I say, with Longbridge, because we're actually charging, then we suspect what's happening is people are making that conscious decision because you've got that capacity at those other car parks that people are, you know, and, 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 and Northfield car park is literally a, a sort of two, three minute drive from 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 Longbridge. So if you've got if you've got the opportunity of a free car park and one that you're going to have to pay for, then then I suspect a lot of users will take that decision to uh, to, to, to go to the free car park on the matter of marketing it we've got gigantic banners on the front of the car park and we did actually do some um, improvements to the road signage and that is something we you know we can certainly look at again we had a marketing campaign ready to go when the car park opened Uh, we did some leaflets and things like that and we were planning to have um, you know staff on the site and things like that because of the restrictions we had with COVID at the time, we we rein back on that. But that's certainly something that you know we we will do as 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 officers. Um, you know, as soon as it's, it's it's appropriate, probably for us to actually start marketing the car park a little bit more and actually encouraging people back onto the onto the onto the network. Especially people who come from out of area. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. We're now driving right into Sally Oak. Mm. David. Uh, thank you, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, over the number of years I've been on this committee, I've always campaigned to get better parking facilities at uh, Cowsley Station. I wonder what the figures are at the present moment. You talk about these being underused uh, in other parts of the borough, what the situation is down there, and how far we've actually looked at the possibility of increasing the facility down there. As far as the borough is concerned, we have two uh, train stations one in the north, one in the south. The one in the south suffers with the same problems that have just been spoken about. Yes, Starbridge gets a lot of people come up from Adley and places like that where they have to pay, so they come to Starbridge where they can park all day free. And that situation has been, gone on there for years. We've extended it down there just to provide for the facilities for people outside the borough. But coming back to my question, is it, coastly. Um, the situation is that a lot of people before this, uh, in the last two years, this problem arisen, uh, were finding it very difficult to get in and out the properties, the drives being blocked and all type of things. And we nev- never took the, the, the situation very seriously in increasing the facility down there. And I wondered what, what the usage was currently uh, on Coastly. And uh, if we looked at the possibility of when things come back to normal, if I could use that terminology, uh, that, you know, we could provide a better service than what we provide uh, in Cowsley, which uh, has been not seriously looked at for quite a number of years. It's a busy station. Uh, it's, a lot of people use it and a lot more would use it. But the difficulty is you don't want to be using your petrol at the cost of it in now. Keep riding around the streets, finding somewhere to park. Thank you. 
Yes, um, actually, um, literally about two days before um, the, 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 the pandemic kicked in back in, in March uh, 2020, I was actually at a meeting in Coesley with, um, with, with, with officers and, and local members to actually look at, look at the options for what we could do at, um, uh, at, at Coesley for, for actually uh, you know, making improvements and so forth. So it is on our agenda as something that we would like to do. Um, and we have looked at options about other pieces of land at Coesley, whether we can we can actually expand the car park in that way. And certainly it's something that that, you know, when we actually come back to looking at um, expansion and so forth, that is probably, you know, if we decide that's what we want to do um, post pandemic, then then that's something that that we will certainly look at. On the on the question of how many people are actually in the car park, I've just pulled up the figures for today and it's actually 32 percent occupancy. So there's actually um, there were actually 13 cars in the car park this morning. So that that's the numbers that uh, that are actually using Coesley at the moment. OK. okay. Right, thank you, Ch Chairman. Uh, thank you. My question is relating to the um, on page 43. 4.11 leading to A34 sprint uh, park and ride. And I can see the barrier, a lot of uh, complicated issues there. And the, we've been working on this for a long time. Do we have any solution in sight? Because that, that part of uh, uh, park and ride is very crucial uh, to, keep, uh, to, uh, to manage the traffic movements coming from off the motorway. Um, do we have, have any hope of uh, delivering this? Thank you. Yeah, Chair, we, we, we have a potential scheme there, which is to 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 actually build a car park um, uh, behind the Bell Pub on the on the A34. At the moment, um, we're still in discussions with 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 officers of both Warsaw and uh, Samuel Council, who are who are also in discussions with their respective uh, members about that scheme. And uh, you know, at the moment, we're so we're still in those discussions as to whether we actually take that scheme forward or whether we don't take that scheme forward. I think Sam Sandy might want to come in on this as well. Thank Sunday. you, Chair. Um, thanks, guys. So just just to pick up the points that guys already made, whilst there is an option there and there are, whilst we've always suggested that uh, a park and ride site in the vicinity of Junction 7 of the M6 would be a good way to intercept some of those car based trips coming into it further into the centre of Birmingham. It is about trying to find the right location. Um, now we have identified a site, but it does have some challenges that's planning. It's got some highway challenges. We'd need to look at the local trip movements to understand what impacts it has on the local roads. And those are the conversations that we are having with um, the local authority partners, both at Sandwall and Warsaw, to understand how we can mitigate against that. Now, just just so councillors are aware, so in terms of the sprint scheme itself, this has not been an integral part of the sprint scheme in the in the in the sense of the business case for sprint is a standalone business case. Obviously, a business case for any park and ride that we develop would be additive to that as long as it meets those local objectives. And that is the work that we need to continue to do with our local authority partners. OK, thank you. Right, Tim. Yes, um, it, 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 one of my questions was on that very point. So that's that's going to be my first question is that. I thought when we agreed to print that the park and ride was an integral part mm, of so did I. the sprint. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said that chair um, mm, because mm. we we as members of um, the then ITA and subsequently TDC um, made it clear it had to be part of the sprint standards. It had to be an integral part of it and had to be delivered at the same time. And um, it, it would appear that this isn't actually going to happen. And um, that, that, is, that is concerning that it wasn't looked at in its holistic format to use that horrible word. Um, but we, we now seem to be placing greater emphasis, uh, if we read the report, on a park and ride on the A38 to support a sprint route that won't be delivered for several years, as opposed to on the A34 North, uh, when uh, for a sprint route that will be operational before the Commonwealth Games. Mm -hmm. And 
uh, without rehashing the arguments, because I think Sandeep has given a, 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 a very comprehensive response, um, it needs to go back a lot further and looking at park and ride the sprint and potentially other forms, combining sprint with other forms of uh, public transport in terms of park and ride, uh, right at the very beginning and making it an integral part of the project rather than as, a, as an add-on after the project has been delivered. Um, so, so that's the first point. Um, the second point was in relation to um, Longbridge Station. Um, and I think Guy um, put his finger on, on the problem that uh, Longbridge is indeed a charge car park. But by continuing to make it charge car park, are we not encouraging rail heading to Northfield, Kings Norton and Selly Oak and actually causing um, further congestion along the road network going in towards Birmingham, um, Birmingham uh, City Centre, given the current pandemic that is that is ongoing? And is anyone thinking of renewing of of reviewing that policy, at least in the short term, to prevent such rail heading. Um, mm -hmm. So th those were my uh, those were my two mm -hmm. questions to share. Okay, mm -hmm. Guy. Yeah, do you want me to, yeah, do you want me to say this, the, take this, the, the, the Longbridge one first, and then, yeah, and yeah. I'll, I can come in on. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. With Longbridge, yeah, that you know, at the moment we we we. We still we've still got it as a, a charge for car park. The problem we've got with Longbridge is that um, it, the way it's actually funded, it's funded through potential borrowing. So um, those user charging needs to be there to actually pay for 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 that car park. So the unfortunate problem is that if we chose to not have the charging there, then we would have to um, you know find some other way of actually funding that car park. Now, I, I recognise the fact that obviously there are less people parking there at the moment, so probably our income is a lot less than we perhaps predicted, but even so, um, any contribution to actually helping fund that car park is is obviously something that, you know, helps helps the, the, the wider authority because obviously if we haven't got that funding, then we've got to find it from somewhere else to, to, to actually fund the thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sandeep? Chair, if if I may, I can see that Councillor Andrew has his hand up. So, is it oh, right. would it be helpful to bring in Councillor Andrew before okay. I respond? Do you want want to link in on this, uh, Adrian? Uh, yes, please, Chair. Okay. Uh, just just on the park and ride uh, uh, along the sprint route, the um, our elected members in Paddock Ward have been campaigning for many, many, many years uh, to get a park and ride along that route. Uh, I have to say. Um, pre pre sprint, when sprint was just an idea in somebody's uh, on somebody's computer, um, so they have been campaigning there for a very very long time. There was a site uh, which would have been acceptable to local residents identified, uh, but then the second site that has been identified um, isn't very acceptable uh, to elected members or local residents in the area partly uh, because of it being a green belt site as well. Uh, there are one or two other ideas that we've got up our sleeve potentially um, in order to deliver the park and ride um, on this uh, stretch uh, of the route. Uh, but it's certainly um, at the moment, it's, it's very, very difficult to deliver along that route because simply finding the correct, the correct and most acceptable site uh, and unfortunately, they're not making land anymore, so uh, it's very difficult to find the site. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Oh, well. and, and just just to sort of provide a couple of points on this. So, as, as Councillor Andrew has said, yes, we've we've looked at a number of options here. There isn't an easy answer to the delivery of this, and we have to do this within the context of the framework that has been adopted around park and the strategic framework for park and ride development, i.e. thinking about the locations where it meets both those local objectives as well as those strategic ones, the impact that it has on a local road network, the environmental considerations, again, particularly where we're building 
within green belt and the sort of issues around planning and mitigating against some of those factors all of those things need to be considered as part of that so the, the feasibility work has been done in parallel to the, the development of sprint um, it was more aligned to the delivery of sprint phase two but it is about providing the right solution in the right place and making sure that it meets those local objectives and as i've mentioned earlier we'll continue to work with sandwall and warsaw officers around what some of those options could be and what those solutions could look like but ultimately what we don't want to be into a position of is particularly where a park and ride needs to be charged and the framework that that is set out now any new park and rides would need to be charged to cover their operational costs is to build a facility that is poorly utilized and then there is an ongoing levy funding requirement to actually make up the operational costs of the site which is a big consideration what we've also seen during the past two years of covid is a very different type of trip making that is happening people are have different patterns of traveling to work whether there's more working from home or different times traveling during the day we've also seen a big increase in people utilizing active travel modes during that time as well so it remains to be seen whether we can continue to make a strong case in some of these locations for a commercially viable park and ride site thank you okay richard uh, yes, uh, this is one for you, uh, Sandeep, and also for you, Adrian. I mean, I, I'm I'm not informed about the detail. I know there's been quite a lot of local opposition um, to the current proposal, but um, sort of hand on heart, both is, is do you think that there is um, the potential for a positive outcome in terms of park and ride that uh, both meets um, local needs and objections where they exist uh, and also the strategic objective of doing what it needs to do it's it's a very difficult one to answer councillor worrell i mean just going back to the final point i made is what we've not seen yet is a clear and pronounced demand for park and ride as it was pre-covid and yeah. that is one of the biggest determining factors in how do you make a commercially viable case for something for a park and ride along a key corridor um, that can cover its operational costs as part of the, the framework that has been established i think we still need to understand where that data goes we know we did start to see a recovery but as guy pointed out earlier we've never seen more than 50 percent usage at any of our park and rides even during that that recovery mm -hmm. phase we've also got very little experience of bus based park and park and ride within mm -hmm. the conurbation so there's a number of factors here that we need to consider as part of doing this and making sure that those are evaluated properly as part of that investment case and that is the work that we need to carry on doing going back to the point that councillor andrew has made and others would make if it was in their locality and i've spent a, quite a lot of time out there with the ward councillors as well is their concerns around just the traffic levels in and around the bell junction already and this is what we're seeing from some of the initial modeling work is that we're actually putting more local car trips onto the network in that location rather than extracting them away from junction seven so those are the considerations that we need we need to actually bear in mind as part of that decision Okay. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. There, 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 there is a solution, but it's going to be very expensive. <laughs> yeah. Which, which again comes back to how do you make exactly. a case for yeah. that sort of investment based on the reduced levels of demand and yeah. the, the likely charge that would need to be in place as well. And in, in, in order for something um, to work properly uh, along there as well, um, in terms of you know the the bus is being able to access it so that people haven't got to run across the road if it's one side or the other mm -hmm. um so they, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot uh, to consider there and as sandeep said you know with covid the the demand the demand's not increasing yet and it's been said uh, earlier in the meeting the demand for public transport isn't increasing so we have to just be very mindful of that mm -hmm. okay right any further comments on this item? No. OK, well, thank you. Thank no. you. Oh, Pete. Chair, sorry, just if I, if I may, just add one point this is just from an earlier part of the discussion, uh, just to pick up. And I think obviously it, it, it links to that latter part of the discussion around 
the a particular scheme on A34, but I heard uh, one uh, one of the questions, and apologies, I can't remember who it was, uh, sort of questioned about the fact that from the CRSTS that there is park and ride linked into CRSTS. And that does link to the schemes that are being talked about that Guy's given the updates on here today as 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 well. So there is a linkage between those two things. The fact that uh, it, it, it refers to park and ride in the CRSTS programme is is linked to those schemes that are being looked to progress uh, subject to the the discussions that have just been uh, had as well and, and i think obviously as as guy talked about the usage levels uh, being uh, extremely low it's just i know this is obvious but it's just worth pointing out and, and reaffirming uh, given the fact that we are now in a, a if you like a further stage of the the uh, the epidemic covid19 position uh, with with the uh, Omicron situation and that further reduction, then it's very, very difficult at the moment to try and pinpoint and predict the timescales of recovery and the options. And indeed, when we talk to other commentators and professionals and industry experts in this space, you know, there is there is there is no real determined knowledge on on how the use of these car parks will bounce back and at what point. So uh, we will continue to evolve those schemes in much more detail with the knowledge that starts to build up as we emerge from whatever situation we emerge from now and whatever we find ourselves in in three, four, five, six months time. Uh, but but obviously we will be keeping a close eye on those places and, and for things like Longbridge where we talk about, I mean, who could have really predicted this position yeah. that we're in when when we predicted and we were building Longbridge, you know, absolutely every car park was uh, full to the gunnels and, mm -hmm. and therefore uh, that that was an obvious and very strategic choice. But there are other elements being supported there as well. So, for example, as we get towards the Commonwealth Games and utilising that that capacity and trying to build a, a sort of stimulus and use out of the uh, out of the location there. And when it comes to marketing and promoting those kind of locations, timing will be absolutely critical uh, in terms of finding out how we're really emerging from the pandemic and, and, and what longevity there is. Same as we're talking about with bus services, you know, you can promote certain things, but then find you're in a different level of government restrictions yes. Yes. six or 12 weeks later. So we do have yes. to be careful because there's only a finite amount of money to go around on these things. Right. Thank you. Absolutely. Point taken. Well, thank you all. Um... For, for your contributions and uh, and to Sandeep and Guy. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Now, we've got the Commonwealth Games Transport Plan Report. A, a lengthier um, a document appears as a uh, combined authority report for their consideration on Friday. Um, who's going to lead? Oh, Graham Jones. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Jay. So, I'll just take you take you through it. Um, this has been here um, before and has been um, socialised quite extensively. I'll, I'll just put, pull up a, a short presentation um, just to give it some context. Um, can you see that slide? Yep. Yeah, OK. So uh, again, uh, I don't want to repeat things that have been said before, but the Games Transport Plan is a, a statutory plan that has been um, directed for the combined authority to prepare by the Secretary of State under the Birmingham Commonwealth Games Act. Um, it's got its five core principles, which are all very self-evident, I'm sure, to people around clean and green, safe and secure, minimising disruption, legacy and access for all. Um, its purpose is twofold really, one to inform businesses and the public of the approach to transport planning uh, and then secondly perhaps just as it, well definitely just as important sets the context for uh, the cooperation and commitment by the relevant authorities to deliver the various transport interventions that will be required. So um, no one organisation is delivering transport for the games, it's a, a collaboration, cooperation between uh, many partners. Um, there is um, attached to papers, I know they're lengthy, there is a uh, equalities impact assessment. Uh, there's also a run through of the responses in broad terms that we received from the consultation and engagement exercise that took place last summer. Um, 
we had quite a number of uh, responses and the themes are in that attached documents against a number of headings which are here on the slide in front of you but nothing there that fundamentally changed um, the plan we have updated the plan to reflect um, the comments and we've stated in the document how we would address those comments um, it's been quite a lengthy journey then from closure of the um, consultation through the various governance uh, boards that you see on the screen in front of you so it's been through uh, Birmingham City Council it's been through TFWM it's been through the organizing committee uh, both their exec group and board um, it's been to the joint transport group which is the uh, collective of the transport partners that I mentioned before um, and it comes to you today Mm -hmm. um, ahead of uh, the combined authority board which is on Friday when um, subject to your views today and subject to the board's views on Friday we would hope it then becomes the final um, document. Once finalised um, there's no further formal process to go through but it would be placed in the uh, parliamentary library of both the House of Lords and House of Commons uh, as it comes under the under the Games Act uh, for information for MPs and the Lords. Uh, I don't intend to go through the document in detail. Like I say you've 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 had this before um, and discussed, but I'm very happy to take any comments or, or questions okay. from uh, people. Okay. Right. Any comments or questions? Zeal? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just one point for clarification. Um, in Periba, near to the Alexander Stadium, um, the residents are living because almost every household, they got a car, so maybe two, three cars. So what will be the advantages for the resident of Periba, uh, you know, during these games? Uh, well, I think there, there will be lots of interruption. So the, many of the residents asking me this question, how they can make sure they can park their car and go out and go in from the yeah. car. So is there any proposed plan for the safety of the resident uh, around Periva? Thank you. Uh, the, there, there is indeed around each of the venues. Um, so Alexander Stadium, obviously the, the, the largest of the venues in Periva, but around each of the venues, we are developing with the local authorities what we know as a local area traffic management and parking plan. Um, the consultation on that will start and that will have attached to it various measures to ensure that residents and businesses uh, are not unduly disrupted and can go about their business. Um, that may be um, uh, parking arrangements to protect businesses and residents, uh, maybe traffic management measures. So the consultation on that is due to start at the end of February um, and through March. Um, so there will be more detail coming through. The Games Transport Plan is by no means the, the end of the matter. The detailed operational plans will follow and uh, those will be consulted on locally. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Linda. Thank you, Chair. Um, Graham, the, the first of the guiding principles is that um, this should be green and clean. Yeah. And since the main part of, of the Games is taking part in, a, a, in an already built up area and we've just heard about um, people's concerns about getting in and out with their own traffic, there will be a, a huge amount of, of, of traffic used in the area during the Games going in and going out. Um, how is the air quality in that area being measured mm. and monitored and managed? Um, because of the increased traffic usage, particularly for, for local people in that area. Will that be within a local plan? Thank you. Uh, that, that would be within the local arrangements with the local authority. Yeah. But we, you know, the whole the whole um, premise of the Games Transport Plan is to not have a significant increase of local um, traffic. We're encouraging people to use park and ride sites and to come in therefore by bus. Uh, we're encouraging people to use the bus shuttles that are being laid on from the city centre to, to, for instance, to Alexander Stadium. We're encouraging people to cycle and walk. And we're providing cycle parking at all of the um, venues. So 
and there is no parking at the venue so uh, and that will be widely publicized to, to make sure that people don't attempt to drive to the venue so um if anything the the the, the amount of traffic local to the venues may reduce um, as a result of the constraints on the area um so i i, I wouldn't anticipate significant changes in um air quality as a result of the games at these locations um, thank you very much, Graham. Can, can I continue, please, Chair? Although there's expectations and encouragement, nevertheless, will the air quality be monitored? Yeah, compared, yeah, benchmarks, yeah. Um, I, yes, I think it, it will be. Um, okay. We're not anticipating putting in extra monitoring, but the local authority will do uh, monitoring uh, already, and I'm sure they'll be keeping a close eye on things during the oh. event. Is there a monitoring unit near to the Alexandra Stadium uh, or the and or the Aquatic Centre? Uh, I'm not exactly sure of locations. Um, I can there is a map, out. isn't there, from that uh, unit at Birmingham University we're going to be visiting, aren't we, uh, in the near future? Um, hmm. Just to take... a comparative just to see what happens. Yeah, I need Jeez. to take that one away and just check on locations. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Celia. Hi, Graham. Thank you Hi. for the yeah, higher, higher. Thanks for your report. Um, I think a lot of work has gone into this, which is really, really good. Um, part of the games um, transport plan is um, the legacy aspect of it, mm -hmm. as well as physical legacy, which is the infrastructural de development that is ongoing and continues to happen until the games time. Um, um, I am hoping that we will have some kind of psychological no. legacy as well. Um, what do I mean when I say psychological legacy? Um, that's um, we. This is a huge monumental event, and I'm hoping that the um, the team, that's your team, is uh, we're going to take the whole opportunity to sort of get into the psyche of commuters in the West Midlands. So, um, and that comes under the engagement plan. Um, you've talked about widely publicizing this, um, but I think we might have missed a very huge opportunity already. You know, this could be salvaged, don't get me wrong. But um, I'm wondering when you're booking the ticket, it doesn't, you, it, there is no subliminal messaging there or even explicit messaging there about the local transport um, in West Midlands. Now, yeah. um, when I was reading your papers, I stumbled into the fact that when the, the, the tickets come with the uh, provisions for public transportation, again, this, is, this wasn't made clear at all whilst you're um, uh, purchasing the ticket. So that, that's what, that is what is making me think we might have missed a huge opportunity there in, in that interaction with the actual people who would be going to watch the games because the actual people going to watch the games are the ones purchasing the ticket. I know there will be footfalls, but the you know the main people who would go to watch the games are missing that opportunity to um, have uh, to to know that they have public transportation there for them to use, as opposed to driving their cars to these venues. So I don't know if you can comment on that at all. Yeah, so that there's been uh, information on that generally on the um, organising committee's website. But when the tickets are actually issued, so nobody's got the tickets yet. When the tickets are actually issued, there will be uh, transport information supplied with them specific to the venue that they are travelling to. So if they if they've got a ticket for Alexander Stadium, with that ticket will be transport information that explains the park and ride arrangements, the booking system for the park and ride, the fact that there is no parking at the venue. So um, it's a question of timing, really. It's not been omitted. It's just um, making sure that when we go with that information, uh, one, it's at the most appropriate time for the um, spectators in planning their journey, but also that we've got as much of that detail completed um, so that we can give them precise information. So that will go out with the ticket. Okay. Okay. Um, so your hands, is it a, a you know, a, an old hand or a brand new hand? So 
I'll take it as being an old one. Any other contributions to this uh, this, this this item? Uh, yes, Chair. Okay, Tim. Uh, thank you. Um, when the information for tickets goes out, I'm assuming that um, we'd be detailing details of the clean air zone and the charging location of the CA set as part of the ticket information, Graham. Is that an accurate assumption to have? Because a lot of people who will be attending the Commonwealth Games will probably know nothing about the CA set in operation in Birmingham and have the potential to be inadvertently caught by it, you know, as they drive through the city centre. So, um, um, uh, could you just clarify that point? And yeah, second, sure. I mean, our, our, our primary aim is to not have people drive to the city centre. Not through uh, it, no. In the first place. But um, we, we can certainly look at that if we think that that's something that we need to put into the transport information, perhaps as a further deterrent to drive into the centre. Um, then we could, but our, our primary uh, aim is to is to um, be proactive in promoting public transport, um, walking and cycling. So we very much hope that people will travel into the city centre on public transport. Well, no, I'm, I'm not just talking about travelling into the city centre. I'm, tra I'm talking about travelling through the city centre because okay. you're just you're charged the same whether you you go straight through the A38 tunnels through the city centre as if you yeah. actually visit the city centre. So okay, this understood. Is, this, yeah, and the second point is um, sort of related to this, and we're, we're setting up, as you said, these temporary park and rides to encourage people to use them and then use sustainable means of transport um, to the games venues. Uh, question A is, how can we be so good at setting up these temporary park and rides, but we seem to be struggling in setting up permanent park and rides? And um, and that's a wider question than the Commonwealth Games plan. But the second is that, again, if we're directing people to these um, temporary park and ride sites, again, can we make it clear that if to get to them, you have to go through the CA set charging area um, to be aware um, of the CA set charging area? Yeah, I think on the latter point, it's a very good point. We do need to make sure that people, when they're booking their park and ride um, sites, understand um, the best route to get to the park and ride site. Now, we, we can't cater for every person, come from every um, point on the compass, but uh, I think you're right. We, we should have that information um, clearly stated for them uh, to discourage them from coming through the city centre. Um, in terms and to make, of... Sorry, and to make sure that there's details of the um, the tracker system where you type in your registration number to see whether your vehicle is CA set compliant or not. Yes, indeed, yes. Okay, yeah. Um, and then in terms of the, um, the temporary nature of these, I mean, some of these sites are being set up for, let's say, Canuck Chase, for instance, which is only a one day event. Um, so there are temporary locations that are being set up, usually generally, using existing car parking, either public or yeah. private car parking, um, specifically for a few days or even a single day of the event. So it's quite a different animal to a permanent um, park and ride site. Um, so they, that said, we, we're aligned with, with our colleagues who are working on the permanent sites, and we are looking always to see what legacy we can generate um, from the Commonwealth Games in terms of more permanent measures. Okay. Right. Any further contributions or questions? We're getting a bit close to really having to uh, to to finish the meeting completely. Um, no more then. Well, thank you, uh, Graham, for coming okay. and updating thank us you. on that. You will you be there at the Combined Authority on Friday? Um, I will, but I won't be presenting. I don't think. I think it'll be Ian Ward, that's uh, Councillor Ian Ward, that's presenting. Um, here we go then. Um, COVID recovery. Can we have a, a quick uh, snapshot of what's going on with our response here to any changes? 
Yeah, I'll just keep this very, very quick. Chair, I'm conscious you just said I know we're close to the uh, uh, meeting close scheduled time. Uh, mm -hmm. But in terms of in terms of just just a quick canter through the most, we've already heard from Tom today with the row report and he touched yes. on uh, on COVID recovery uh, levels there. But of course, with the onset of the plan B measures that came in, uh, prior to Christmas, then we had seen a reduction in overall uh, usage levels through December of rail to between 35 to 40 percent. Members will recall that had uh, climbed up further to be over 50 percent. On the uh, bus service side of things, uh, we have stabilised a little bit around 74 percent, 73, 74 percent of pre-COVID passenger usage level with the advent of uh, Plan B. I think it's probably uh, measured that we probably would be around 82 to 84 percent in the event of a non plan B, non uh, if, if in, in the event that uh, Omicron hadn't uh, of, uh, of emerged and uh, come towards us. And with regards to the metro and metro recovery, uh, uh, obviously members are aware that there have been other factors in play there. But in terms of the revised uh, metro service, uh, we are around about 60 percent of pre-COVID patronage on that service uh, last week as well. And people will also be aware, as mentioned by Tom, with regards to rail, that one of the key issues is around the high level of transmission on the uh, Omicron and therefore the impact that is having on staff availability as was talked about for rail as a similar impact there for bus services at the moment we understand that uh, particularly with National Express but as a bit of an average then that we have over 10 percent driver sickness at the moment and obviously that is impacting in some areas on service delivery and working very closely with the bus operators to make sure that we understand how and where and what the communication channels are uh, around impact to service delivery as well. Uh, we're not seeing the same on that on the metro service at the moment, so that isn't uh, factored into uh, in, 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 into there. And of course, uh, comms, uh, we now await further information from government on the next revised dates for uh, information and updates around uh, Plan B as well. So th there are other little bits and bobs, but if I just leave it there, that's just to give a condensed overview of some okay. of the core in bits of information I was going to drop in today, Chair. OK. Uh, any uh, larger scale um, news or changes, you can always, you know, do a briefing to us all. So Absolutely. That, so yeah. We can pass it on to our uh, colleagues and constituents. Thank you. OK, we now come on to item 13. These are the uh, <laughs> reports that are coming before the Combined Authority on Friday. Now, the Combined sorry, Authority sorry, will meet. Can I yeah. just sorry um do you want to take the meg report first and then come back to the oh, ca board report just because i'm conscious that some of the ca board reports that you're going to talk about are in the private session one is yes yeah so i'll be not well because we're like so, oh right sorry no, item. okay no we haven't sorry okay let's look at the megs first and then uh anyone want to make a comment on uh, item 14, the uh, MEG reports. I know that the air uh, quality group met last week um, and we're hoping that uh, their uh, notes will be circulated to everybody uh, once Chairman has agreed to the, uh, the write-up. Any comments on 14? Okay. Uh, Chairman. We have our meeting on the 5th of January yeah. and um, uh, obviously, we discussed various issues relating to um, uh, the PM 2.5, uh, which is about 25, 20 percent of the uh, PM 2.5 caused by the by, uh, by the transport. And we also um, uh, the the meeting of the Women's University for the air quality, and which will be open to all the TDC members. Yes. Yes. And then we also raised the issue of, um, I think, K Mark will raise the issue of uh, diesel trains, uh, freight trains, hardening at, um, um, at, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. and causing pollution. So we, I have asked for that to be looked into, what yeah. Yeah. we can yeah. do about it. Chairman, so, the, the stuff that we were going to do on a visit to Birmingham University, it's going to be a presentation now. Okay, well, 
Yeah. We've all got access to that. Or online, so yeah. This is the write-up of your meeting last must be. That, that I have asked that we circ circulated. circulated. Yeah. Once yeah. you've agreed to uh, the yeah. write-up. Okay. It'll be done. No, Richard. Uh, yes, Chair. No wish to prolong things even more. Um, simply to recall my thanks for you taking oh, the chair okay. of the Rail and Metro Meg. I was attending one out of four funerals that I attended in the week Fine. in the it's Christmas. So thank you very much. OK, no problem. Um, right. Um, OK, the reports to the Combined Authority. Now, the Combined Authority will be meeting online on Monday, on uh, Friday, completely, which means that it's an informal meeting. Uh, and the Chief Executive has made arrangements to use powers under the relevant, relevant Act for her to take the advice of the leaders and then to implement their views on these important issues that we've got on these reports. One of them is the uh, Winsbury to Briarley Hill Metro report, which you received quite late. Uh, it is a private report. But let's have a look at the, it's about four, four or so, oh gosh, my PC's gone down. Um, let's have a look at them. Does anybody have anything to say on them? I could pass on your views, but I don't know how they'll be fixed for uh, the time, actually, on uh, on Friday. The first one is the crust. And oh, I understand someone from the Department for Transport is going to be observing this meeting to ensure that uh, everything stays within, uh, you know, the, the you know the the national priorities and and as stated in the original uh, settlement. Um, any comments on the crust? Uh, Chair, just uh, in terms of before, before you do take comments, just uh, that point that you made there. Uh, yes, that's that's our understanding with regards to uh, reference from the uh, uh, from from the government in in terms of actually seeing the meeting, uh, and then that's also why you'll you'll within the reports. Obviously, then there is the uh, report setting out CRSTS. And then uh, privately, there is the appendix which sets out more detail uh, yeah. about the proposal, the local proposals around the individual schemes, which would, of course, preempt any government review of the business cases associated yeah. with them. Yes, indeed. OK, no comments. Um, Chair? Tim, sorry. Well, I think, I think Richard was first. Richard, no, is that? That's no, a legendary one. An old okay. one, Tim. OK, uh, given how important it is, because as I understand it, it's 1.05 billion in total and 788 million in terms of new money, if I've got that correct. Um, would it be worth having a more detailed briefing um, to the whole of the TDC about all the schemes and proposals contained within it? Because yeah. Given timing, given it's a 105 page document by my calculations, it's we're not going to be able to give it justice. No, and obviously indeed, not. Um, um, uh, the WMCA members and the DFT will obviously um, be discussing it on Friday. So it'd be, I think it'd yeah. be particularly interesting to hear the outcome of those discussions given the schemes, oh, the appendix. I, I mean, you did originally. Uh late last year suggests that we have a session to do our own prioritisation, which I think at the time I thought might be a little uh, impertinent to not be, not be taken on too kindly uh, by uh, the authority, but they have got this uh, priority, uh, um, priority list, reserve schemes and so on, which uh, I think we might want to look at, as it, as it pertains to our local authorities. Um, OK, right. So, well, when shall we have that? We should have it uh, whew, before the end of January or early February. Well, or, uh, just before the February TDC. Yes, that's my suggestion. OK, right, Tanya, you've got that now. 
I yeah, was just about to, to suggest. I don't put anything else in as a, as a, as a view. And, and can, to I, be... can, can I just say, I, I, I see one of those schemes is um, something we've already discussed today. Mm -hmm. And that's um, additional railway stations within yes. the West Midlands. Yes, well, we've heard and park and ride too, and and park and ride too. Yes. So uh, I'm sure officers, when they uh, they could um, see which um, items of interest in particular have been raised at today's meeting, mm -hmm. and link it in, um, sort of um, cross index it with uh, with the proposals in the CR STS. Yeah. Um, yes, yes. OK, OK, so we got our briefing for the next uh, next Monday, next uh, TDC day. OK, was that am I right in thinking it's the future bus delivery options? Madam Chairman, I have indicated to speak. Oh, sorry, David. Yeah. Running out of time. Yeah, it, I, I, should, I should be very quick about this. Now, the document I received at one minute past 12, less than an hour before the meeting, is a very important document on the on the Metro. What I can't understand is why do we have to receive these less than an hour before the meeting when it clearly could have been sent out last week for us to have gone through first to have commented on? Thank you. Is this the the uh, Wednesday to Briley Hill? That's right, yes. But we it's did, late we... of necessity because it's not our report. Yeah. We are not in a position Chair. to receive these reports before the combined authority does. Uh, Chair, can I just comment that we, we can pick that up in the private session after this yeah. uh, main meeting, if that's OK? Absolutely. So let's look at the, um, the future bus delivery options. I think we are aware of the way this was uh, developing. Any comments? Go with an enhanced partnership, you know, on certain, the present conditions. Um, but always, always uh, open to uh, to review when we see, you know, um, how things develop. Yeah. What's the other one? I'm having to wind down a bit now. Um, local transport plan, draft course strategy. We've looked at that last year too. It's another one of those documents that take a lot of your ink if you've minded to print it out. Any comments? No? Gosh, I'm probably really having to. What's the uh, what's the other one that's uh, that's not private? That's Commonwealth Games Chair, which we've already well, been. The Commonwealth through. Games one, and we've kind of almost been there and done that. Any further comments on it? No. no. OK, let's uh, I think that's it for the for the non uh, the non uh, private ones. OK, now I must ask anybody who is a member of the public uh, or who needs to who really should uh, leave the meeting to do so now. Because we're now going to look at 